بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلوات وصلواته والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه اله وسلم الحمد لله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته we're in inshallah the seventh session on Jawahar al-Quran and inshallah I'm hoping to get through uh, the entire book today so we might move a little faster than I would like to. Uh, yesterday we talked about the eight doors of paradise that the Fatiha opens up and um, the importance also of the Fatiha as containing all of the meanings uh, of the Quran. So the opening chapter that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us, which is the one we recite in every prayer, really is a summation of the entire Qur'an. And the Prophet sallallahu said that he was given the Qur'an. Uh, it's the equivalent of the Torah, the Injil, the Psalms. So the first seven, the, what are called the Sab'a Qiwal or Tawal, are equivalent to the Torah. And then the Mi'in Surahs, the ones that have around the hundred uh, ayahs in them, are equivalent to the Injil. And then the Mathani are equivalent to the Zabur. And then from Qaf to the end, he said, وَفُضِلْتُ mufassal." But the Mufassal is my, it's the, the, this, these are the ones that I was preferred over the previous uh, revelation. So the Quran really contains all of the Abrahamic dispensations and the Fatiha contains all of them. And that's why it's, it's such a central book. Now, if you look at the two halves of the Fatiha, According to Imam al-Ghazali's theory, one half is jawahir and then the other half is pearls because he has the durar. The jawahir are those that relate to knowledge of God and the durar are those that relate to how we get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the path to God. And so if you look at the chapter, there's a famous hadith which is in the Sahih collection that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that he Qasamtu al-Fatiha or al-Salah bayni wa bayna abdi nusfain wali abdi ma sa'al So the, the, the Fatiha is divided into two Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this in the hadith al-Qudsi فَإِذَا قَالَ الْعَبْدِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ That strengthens the opinion uh, that the Fatiha begins with al-hamd and not uh, bismillah but this uh, valid khilaf قَالَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَ حَمِدَنِي عَبْدِي my, my servant has praised me. So this is Jawhar. And then الرحمن الرحيم وَإِذَا قَالَ الرحمن الرحيم قَالَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَ أَثْنَ عَلَيَّ عَبْدِي My servant has glorified me. وَإِذَا قَالَ مَالِكِي or مَلِكِي يَوْمِ الدِّينِ قَالَ مَجَّدَنِي عَبْدِي my, uh, my servant has magnified me, glorified me, Al-Majid. Uh, so that that is uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdu wa thana wa tamjeed lillahi ta'ala. And then, إِذَا قَالَ إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ قَالَ هَذَا بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَ عَبْدِي وَلِعَبْدِ مَا سَأَلْ So now this is, the first is, is Allah's. It's, it's, it's to, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the second half, is هذا بيني وبين عبدي ولي عبدي ما سأل فإذا قال اهدنا سراط المستقيم سراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين قال هذا لي عبدي ولي عبدي ما سأل so that half is uh, to uh, the servant so there you have this, the, the, the two the جواهر and the دورار now we go to آية الكرسي and this is a uh, in Surah Al-Baqarah, this is a key verse in the Jawahir. So this is probably the most important of all the Jawahir verses. Ayat al-Kursi is the Sayyida. So it's, it's the, the mistress of the verses of the Quran. And the reason for that is because it really directly, uh, it directly indicates the, the, the nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah is telling us who he is in this verse So he says 
it tells us all three of the aspects. So if you remember the yawaqit al-thalath in the kibrit al-ahmar, the red sulfur, you have the three yawaqit. So you have yaqut al-ahmar, yaqut al-akhab, yaqut al-asfar. This uh, has all of them. So he's saying that this, in that way, contains all of the... Um, uh, all of these meanings. And then Ayat al-Kursi tishtimilu ala ma'rifa al-udhma alati hiya al-matbu'a wal-maqsuda alati yatba'uha sayru al-ma'arif. So all of the knowledges follow from these knowledges because all knowledges follow from knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so it begins Allah. So this is really essentially the mubtada in, in grammar. It, it begins the mubtada it begins with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah is the ism of that. It's, it's the indication of the essence. It's not, it's not an, a name of attribute. So there's no attribute uh, associated with that name. It's, some say, you know, the, the ulama differ on is it uh, from al-ilah, and then there's an idgham, and then others say, no, it's actually, uh, it's specific to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not the God. It's Allah's name. So you have the man, and then you have Yahya. So this is like that ism alam to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It indicates uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's essence. And that's why many of them say that it's the ism Allah al-a'zam. It's the greatest name. There's khilaf. These are all khilaf issues. But the point is, the name Allah is Allah's alone. And, and it can't, al-ilah, can, you can have alihat. Just like in English, you can have gods. You can have God and gods. But you can't have the God, like the only God. So this is Allah. And then, la ilaha illahu. So here's the, uh, there is no God but he. So th th this indicates immediately Allah, la ilaha illahu. So Allah is letting us know that he is the only one because the, 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 the Jahili Arabs believe that Allah was the greatest God, but all these other alihat were ways that they, they worshiped them, like to get close to God. In fact, just a little interesting side note, uh, the, the, the great Algerian Mujahid and Alim, um, Amir Abdul Qadir al-Jazairi, he actually said that it was the humility of the Arabs that they didn't see themselves as worthy of asking Allah directly. And so it, they really saw like, who are we to ask Allah? And so this was like Allah removing all of those and saying, no, you are my special creation. I created you to ask me directly. And so Allah removed the shirk. So, la ilaha illahu. And then, this is an ishara, ira tawheedu that, just to know that this is absolutely one God, there's only one. al hayyul qayyum This is really important too, because what are the first two attributes that he gives to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this? al hay and al qayyum He doesn't say hayyun qayyumun, because if he was hayyun, if, if it was nekira, then you could have death also. Like, we're hay, but there's no al hay. No human being is al hay. Because the ma'rifah indicates that he is the living. In other words, he doesn't die. Al hay, and then al qayyum. Qayyum is a, a very uh, vast word, it has a lot of different meanings. It's, it's a sifa mubalagha in Arabic, so it's a hyperbolic form from qa'im. And so the qa'im is the one who takes care of things, right? In, in, in dunya, if you have a qa'im, it's, it's somebody who takes care of things. Here, the qayyum is the one, he's al qayyum bi umur al khalq. He takes care of all of his creation's matters. So he's but it also indicates he's qa'im bi nafsihi. So it has both meanings. He's self-subsistent. He's, he, he's, he has ipsiety in, in and of himself. He does not need anything. He needs no space. Like we need space. We have to occupy space. He's made us creatures that have to occupy space. We can't subsist without being in 
time and space. Whereas Allah is, He has, there's no time or space. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has, he, he, there's no place. He's in no place because He's infinite. So we can't imagine this. And that's why the Prophet sallam, said, La tafakkuru fi Allah. Don't think about the essence of Allah. It means fi dhatillah. Don't think about the essence of Allah because you can't take it. And that's why, in fact, Cantor, the great German uh, mathematician who did all his research on infinity, ended up in an insane asylum. Because if you think about infinity, you will go mad. And so the Prophet ﷺ told us, don't think about infinity. Only think about the Allah of Allah. Reflect on his creation. Reflect on his attributes. But don't think about infinity. Because you're, you, you are a finite creature and you can't grasp this. So Al-Hayyur Qayyum is he is self-sustaining. He is ever-sustaining. He's also sustaining his creation. Both. And it's in that. So this is an ishara ila sifat al that wa jalalihi, the, the ma magnificence of it, for the meaning of self-subsisting and all-sustaining is one who is self-sustaining while all other things are sustained by him. So one of the definitions of it, ilah, is al-mustaghni an al-kul wa kullun muftaqirun ilahi. That's one of the theologians give this definition of Allah. He is the one that is completely uh, independent, rich, in himself, and yet everything is dependent on him. Allahu al Ghani, right? Allah is al Ghani wa antum al Fuqara. You are in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La ta'khuduhu sinatun wa la nawm. After saying he's al Hayyul Qayyum, Allah tells us that neither slumber nor sleep overtakes him. So, slumber here, sinna is just to, to, it's the beginning of sleep. What the Arabs call nu'as. It's where you begin to doze off. Like people now when they're fasting at the end of the day, they feel the dozing off. So, so Allah is telling us that, and, and the thing about sleep, there's a beautiful Milton called sleep, the gentle tyrant. The, it's a beautiful term. Al-Jabbar al-Latif. Because you cannot... Sleep will, 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 will take you over, and you cannot fight off sleep. It, it will win, always. The you see little children, because consciousness is so interesting to them, when they're little, they don't want to go to sleep because they're excited. And they, they know I want to stay up because they want, to, they, want, they want to see what's going on. But then you see them, and then they just crash. We call it crashing, right? So, so... Ta'khuduhu here, it did, he didn't say that he doesn't, uh, you know, sinna or la yanam. He said la ta'khuduhu, because sleep is something that overtakes you, right? And then he repeats wa la, noam, because in the Arabic, if it was la ta'khuduhu sinatun wa noam, then it could be one or the other overtakes him. But here, sinna wa la noam, neither drowsiness nor sleep will overtake him. So he's constantly, in fact, if he turned away from creation, his qayyumiya, for one lahza, it would disappear. Isn't it enough that he's constantly witnessing creation? If he wasn't witnessing creation, it would disappear. In the same way that when you, uh, not in the same way, but if you're looking at something and then you turn away from it, from your subjective experience, it disappears. And in fact, there's a whole philosophy based on whether or not that exists or not, right? Solipsism, do, do things exist when we're not witnessing them? So Allah says it's enough as a proof that he's witnessing everything. Because without his mushahada, it doesn't exist. And that's his ayn al you know, he's looking, tajribi ayunina. His inaya is constant. So, la ta'khudhu sinatun wa la noom. Tanzihum wa taqdeesun lahu amma yastahilu alayhim in awsaf al hawadith. Because this is, the, these are qualities of created things. So, he has tanzih, he has uh, transcendence uh, above and beyond these attributes of accidents, which are impossible in his case. Freedom from what is impossible in his case is not one of the obscure divisions of knowledge of him. 
Rather, it is the clearest of them. So this is the via negativa, the things that, that we negate about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the easiest thing. It's harder to say things about God. It's easier to say things that aren't God, right? Kulluma yakhturu bi barik, Allahu khilafu dharik. Anything that comes to your mind, Allah is other than that. That's a qa'idah in, in, uh, in, in, the, in Muslim theology. Anything, kulluma khattara bi barik, Allahu khilafu dharik. Anything that occurs to your mind, Allah is other than that. Lahu ma fis samawati wa ma fil ard. Again, you see the beauty of the Arabic language because lahu, he doesn't say ma fis samawati wa ma fil ard lahu. Lahu, because it's muqaddam, indicates that it's solely his. It's solely his. And he has no sharik in what's in the heavens and in the earth. So this is a ishara ila kulliha wa anna jami'aha minhu. All of it is his. Ma fi samawati wa ma fi So it's a, it's for umum. It's called the Arabs call that sigal al umum. Everything in the heavens and the earth and is 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 his. Man the ladi yashfa'u andahu illa bi idni. Who and this is a, this is what the Balagiyun call istifham inkari. This this is actually stronger than saying. No one can intercede except with his. So if I said, if I said, for instance, uh, no one is 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 a greater uh, a poet than Al Mutanabbi or Rumi for the uh, Afghan people here. No one is a greater poet than Rumi. That's very different than saying who is a greater poet than Rumi. It's stronger because it's a challenge, right? You're challenging them. Let, let's hear you say. So Allah says, "Men the ladi," and then "Men the." You know, He could have said "Men al ladi," but He says "Men the," and this is this is again the challenge. Like in 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 the uh, uh, in 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 when when Ibrahim challenges them. He says, Mada ta'budun. But when he asks them, he says, Ma ta'buduna. You know, what do you what, what are you worshiping? When you, but when he's saying, Mada ta'budun, he's telling them, what are you worshiping? So this is this is stronger than saying man uh, is stronger than saying man. Alladi yashfa'u. So the shafa'a, shafa'a is, is a very important concept in our tradition. And the Prophet is, is the greatest. Uh, of you know, he has the shafa'a on the day of judgment. He's the only one, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, that has that maqam initially, and then after that, Allah subhanahu wa taala gives permission for others. But nobody can intercede before the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He has that maqam. It's maqam al Mahmud ana laha. He says, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So, but it's with the idhan of Allah. So Allah is letting us know that no one has intercession. So nobody speaks before the merciful illa bi idnihi. So this is ishara ila infiradihi bil mulk wal hukum wal amr. These are all his alone. Sovereignty, authority, and command. So no, whoever will have the right of intercession will possess it only because Allah ennobles him and permits him. And this negates partnership. Many, many people will have intercession on the Yom Qiyamah. Like the Hufad who actually practiced the Quran will have intercession. The Shuhada will have intercession. Um, many, many people, but always the first is granted to the Prophet ﷺ, and then the other prophets will have intercession. Uh, people can intercede for their families. That's why one of the things uh, some of the Arabs they say, "Anaji yaqhudu yadi akhihi." You know, when when then when they leave, they'll shake hands and say, "Anaji yaqhudu yadi akhihi." You know, the one if you're saved, take my hand. Whoever of us is saved. Let him take the other's hand, you know, as an intercession. So this is something. So he knows everything. He knows our what's 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 the, the future, and he knows the past. He knows everything that will happen to us. He knows everything that's happened to us. Everything has been recorded. The, he has his angels because Allah has created a world of asbab, but he knows. 
And one of the things about his judgment on Yom Qiyamah, and this is very interesting, there's a principle in fiqh that al-qadi la yaqdi bi'ilmihi. So the qadi, who's, whoever's a judge, cannot judge by his knowledge. So he has to recuse himself. So for instance, if I know that this person murdered somebody, I can't, I'm not, I can't judge with my knowledge. I have to hear all the facts. I have to, so, so the judge can't just say, oh, you're guilty. And Allah, uh, he has established that principle for himself on the day of judgment, out of his justice. Even though he's just, even if he condemned us without any court, he would be just because he can't be unjust. But he has established justice in the world. And he's told us to be just. I have prohibited my own self to oppress, even though he can't oppress by his very nature. But he's telling us, that he prohibited for himself. And then he said to his servants, oh, my servants, do not oppress. In other words, be just. So he will not judge with his knowledge. He could just send us to hell or to heaven. Inshallah, everybody, may Allah give us, make us people of Jannah. But he could just send people. And even if he sent the whole of creation, he would be just in that because he can do what he wants with his creation. So when he said that, that, we will be judged based on testimony. So our hands will testify against us. Our, our eyes will testify against us. Our ears will testify. We can't deny it. They'll say, no, I stole. He made me steal. And that's why the limbs, are there. they fear because they don't want to go to, the body doesn't want to go, just like nobody wants to go to the fire in the dunya. Like you see a fire, and if somebody's trying to force you into it, you're going to have immense fear and trepidation. That's the way the body is. The body does not want to go to hell. And so we're being told that he knows everything. And yet, despite that, he is going to have a trial for everybody. They will all have their trial and they will have their day in court. Everybody will have their day. Even the animals are all raised up. The animals get their, their day. You know, they say in English, every dog has his day. That's true. It is a true proverb. And then ishar ila sifat al-in wa tafdil ba'd al-ma'lumat wa al-infirad bil-in. That he alone, he is fawqa kulli di ilm al-alim. Allah alone is al-alam. He is al-alam al-ghayub. He knows everything. Huwa ma'akum. Right? He's with you. His ma'iyah is too. He has ma'iyah al-ilm and ma'iyah al-inayah. So he's with the believers in Allah ma'a sabirin. Allah is with the impatient in his knowledge, but he's with the patient in his inaya. So he's always, his knowledge is He's always aware. And then Now, this is really important in light of what we know about other dimensions and all these things uh, in in in, in um, you know, they're, they're talking about all these uh, possible dimensions in the world. And we also know that dark matter is, they think it's the, the vast majority of the universe is unseen. So they actually see what we can actually see is a tiny portion of what's actually there. So they actually, theoretically, their own uh, scientists are saying there's a whole unseen realm that we know is there, but we can't see it because... We don't have material access to it. The dark matter, they call it. It might be light matter. They don't know. It's dark to them. But it could be light. So when he says, There are hadiths that indicate, some. there's, a, there's a many variations of it, and they have some weakness in them, but the meanings are sound. Where the Prophet, and they're different versions. The Prophet once was sitting with Sahaba, and he said, how, do you know what's beyond this heaven? He said, it's another 500 years. And beyond this heaven is another 500. So he's letting them know. And he might have just been using numbers that are high to indicate that we don't know. Because in some it says 70 years. And 70 is used by the Arabs to indicate something uh, extensive. Like elf. Uh, a thousand is, is something the Arabs use just to mean a lot. 
I've like we say in English, I told you a thousand times. You probably didn't tell them a thousand times, but it's a hyperbole. So the same is true, like Alf Layla wa Layla, a thousand and one nights. It's like they go on forever. So in in in, in the traditions, the Prophet said that the kursi, the the mal kursi ila al arsh illa kahalqa milqat fi ardi falatin. Right? The 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 the, the, the footstool to the throne, the dimension of it to the throne is like a ring of hadid in one riwaya in the midst of a vast desert. So this is just between, and that's why Allah, in many du'as, you'll see Rabbul Arsh al Azim for that reason, in many du'as. Because we can, so you can imagine, this is the foot, the footstool contains in the entire universe is contained in the footstool. And the footstool to the arsh is like a small iron ring in the midst of a desert. So it's just, it's, you, it's just, you just have to put your head on the ground. This is the point. You just do sajda and say, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, which can mean the greatest, but really it means greater. Allah is greater than anything you can comprehend, anything you can think of. And people will exhaust themselves. Ma qadrullah haqqa qadrihi. They will never give Allah his true estimation because Allah cannot be measured. So this is just his throne and his foot. I mean, the kursi, there's a khilaf about is the ars, uh, the, 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 like a chair. I mean, you're not even supposed to do that because um, it's anthropomorphism. We can't, we can't do that. In fact, uh, Qadi Abu Bakr said, anybody that mentions the hand of God and then uses his hand to, to indicate, he said, you should be flogged. So we can't, we can't, these are, these are analogies to let us know that, you know, every, every, every king in the dunya has a, a throne and a footstool. So Allah is giving us, but his, the modalities, bila cave, we can't, there's no way we can comprehend what these mean. Uh, in, in, in it's, they're just approximations, taqrib al-ma'ani, everything. That's why in, 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 in the, uh, Somebody came to a Syrian Sheikh, Sheikh Hisham al Barhani, told me this story. Allah He said that, uh, you know, somebody came and he said he saw in a dream that he was eating macaroni in Jannah, macarona. You know, the Arabs say macarona. He said, La, 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 kunta ta'kuru ma qara'na. No, you were eating what we read about in the Quran, right? So, and the point of that is that there's nothing in the afterlife that relates to the dunya according to Ibn Abbas, illa al asma. Laysa fil jannah min al dunya illa al asma. They share the names, but we can't conceive. Ma la ainun ra'at, wa la udhnun sami'at, wa la khatara ala qalbi bashar. That's jannah. It's what no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and, and never occurred to the heart of a human being. So everything that you read, they're just to give you some kind of a problem. In the same way that we know Allah's hearing only because we know what hearing is, but you can't in any way think that his hearing is like our hearing. It's just to approximate those meanings. So this, this indicates the greatness of God's sovereignty, the perfection of his power, right? And, and, and it is a noble and obscure knowledge. So it's something hidden from us. وَلَا يُؤُودُهُ وَحِوْضُهُمَا and then again, it, there's no weariness from preserving the heavens and the earth. And he is the most high, the, 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 the magnificent, the vast, the tremendous. So he says, this is an ishara ila sifat al qudra wa kamariha wa tanzihi an al da'af wa nuqsan or al da'af. So, so this indicates divine attributes of power and its perfection and freedom from weakness and imperfection. He says that um, he could go into great detail about those. Now, Surah Yasin is called Qalb al-Quran. And this is a surah that you could spend an immense amount of time on. It's one of the most important 
the traditionally practices of the Muslims. Uh, Yasin is a very important uh, spiritual practice. Um, some say it's a name of the Prophet. Imam Malik Ibn Abi Zaid mentions in the Risala that he didn't like to use the name for uh, a, a person because he said it might be a name of God. And there are names like that. But uh, gen uh, generally, it's been used as a name. Some say it's a name of the Prophet. It comes from Ya Insan. Um, so the virtues are many. Uh, and there are hadiths. قَلْبَ الْقُرَانِ يَاسِينَ لَا يَقْرَأُهَا رَجُلٌ يُرِيدُ اللَّهَ وَالدَّارُ الْآخِرَةِ إِلَّا غَفْرَ اللَّهُ لَهُ يَقْرَأُهَا عَلَى مَوْتَاكُمْ That's related by uh, Al-Hakim and Ibn Hibban. Consider it Sahih. It's related by Imam Ahmed. Just a latifa that I learned from the muhaddithun that I studied with. Whenever you have Ahmed, he should always be before the other, unless it's Malik. So if, 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 it's, if, if they're, if they're going to say, whenever you see somebody with tahqiq who says, Rawahu at tirmidhi wa Ahmed, you know that the persons what didn't study with muhaddithun. Because the adab of the muhaddithun, they'll always put the higher the maqam. So even Malik and Ahmed are over al-Bukhari. Even though al-Bukhari is Imam al muhaddithin in that way. Um, but uh, so Ahmed always goes first. And al-Hakam is very important because he tried to find all of the hadiths that Imam al-Bukhari and Imam Muslim missed that were sahih. So he did the, there is istidrak. He's, the mustadrak is to, to find those. But he is not as rigorous in his saha. So some people will say these are weak hadiths. Um, this one is in At-Tirmidhi. Qad uh, At-Tirmidhi. Hada hadithun gharib. Gharib doesn't necessarily mean that it's not a good hadith. Uh, it's just related to the Rawi, one of the uh, chains, and then looking at other hadith in relation to it. So, inna li kulli shay'in qalba wa qalbur quran yasin. Wa man qara'a yasin katab allahu lahu bi qira'atiha qira'at al-Quran ashara marrat. It's a weak hadith. Uh, but again, our ulama said that you can use weak hadith for fadail al-amal. And that's the practice. I know there's a lot of people in the modern period. And there's something to be said for restoring the rigor of hadith. And so the impulse to do that was, was a positive impulse because a lot of later ulama got very lazy about the, the hadith. So you'll find hadith mentioned in a lot of the later books uh, where they don't really let you know this is a weak hadith. It's good to know that, that uh, hadith are weak. But for common people... Traditionally, the 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 wa'al and things encourage them to do these things because they're they're good for them. Um, so uh, this man qara yasin fi laylatan asbah maghfurun lahu la yasih, which does not mean that the Prophet ﷺ didn't say it. it; just means it's not sahih. It doesn't have that rigor. And then yasin di maqri atsalahu, I think is very weak. Some say it's maldu'ah, but again, these are hadiths that um, have been used by the community for centuries. Uh, and so traditionally, Yasin is really important. I, and I'm not going to go into Yasin because it's that would be a whole, that's several lectures on their own, really. Now we get to uh, Surah Al Ikhlas. And again, these are called Qawari' al Quran. These are the Qawari'. Imam Al Nisabori wrote a book called Qawari' al Quran, specifically about all of these different ayahs and, and, and verses, uh, uh, surahs that are used. Uh, for protection and other things. Qul huwa Allahu ahad is a miracle of this religion. Uh, arguably, this is the single most powerful theological summation that you will find in world religions. I don't think, personally, I don't think you could find any other, certainly not the monotheistic religions that have anything like this. I, I really believe that. Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Ta'diru thurath al-Qur'an. Why? Because a third of the Qur'an is to, to, to tell you who God is. And this surah does it. In, in, in similar, even more so than Ayatul Kursi. One of the things about Ayatul Kursi, if you look at it, it's every single uh, phrase in Ayatul Kursi can be a khabar of Allah. So if you look at each one, Allah, right? La ilaha illahu. That's a, that's a jumla. Allah al-hayyur qayyum. 
Allah la ta'khudhu sanatun. Each one is its own sentence about Allah. So each one of those, Allah man the ladhi yushba'u anduhu. Right? The istifham can be a khabar. So each one of those is telling you about Allah. In this one, Allah is doing something really quite extraordinary because there are eight ways that you can have kufr. And all eight are negated in this uh, surah. So Imam al-Ghazali says, this surah is ma'rifatullah wa tawheeduhu. It will give you knowledge of God and knowledge of his conceptual unification, like how we make him one. And then taqdeesuhu an musharikin fil jinsi wa nu'a. Allah, you have the genus, and then you have, so so in, in uh, you know, you have, you have, these are called the five predicables in logic. So you have the jins, and then you have the nu'a, you have the fasl, you have the arad al-khas, and then, then you have arad al-am. When we speak about uh, things, we use, these are the five Predicables. Anything you say about anything is going to have one of these five things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no musharak when we speak about Allah. Allah is unique alone in, 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 in his reality. And so there's, there's no genus. He has no, there's no genus. Like he, he is his own unique reality. Everything else, like we're of the genus, our jins is haywan. Like the flower's jins is nabat. The dhahab, the genus is uh, mineral. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is outside these concepts. We, we can't place him in these. So, so that's one of the things that this does. murad bi nafi al asal wa farah wa kuf. So there's no asal, there's no farah, and there's no kuf. There's, there's no origin. There's no, nothing comes out of him as a far, as a branch, like a child. And then there's, there's nothing, uh, he has no kuf, he has no peer. وَوَصْفُهُ بِالصَّمَدِ يُشْعِرُ بِأَنَّهُ صَمَدِ الَّذِي لَا مَقْصِدَ فِي الْوُجُودِ لَلْحَوَائِجِ سِوَاهُ So the attribute of self-existing and, uh, and besought of all informs us that in existence there is no one other than him who can be sought for the fulfillment of needs. So, tenfi anwa al kufra thamaniya. So, it negates eight types of disbelief. And this is what, what in Western theology calls the via negativa. So, when you say, qulhu Allahu ahad, and remember, ahad in Arabic, you have wahid and you have ahad. Ahad is like unique, wahid is one. Wahid in Arabic is not a number. Numbers begin with two. So wahid is not considered a number. And that's why in Allah Yuhub al Witr, right? He loves the odd. Numbers begin, the odd number begins with three. And there are many threes in creation. In fact, this tripped up a whole religion because there's so many threes in creation. It's very easy to see trinities everywhere. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one, wahidun. And, and it, so it negates composition and number. Composition means he's not murakkab. So there's no parts. And then number means that, he, that he's, there's, there's no adad. Allah is wahidun. It's not a number. He's unique. There's nothing beside him. Because the whole point of numbers, you have to have more than one to have numbers. Because there's nothing beside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Can Allah wa lam yukun ma'ahu shay? Allah was and there was nothing with him. Unique. And then Allahu samad, there's a lot of uh, different interpretations of samad, but essentially the samad is the one who is, does not need anybody but people flee to, to that one in their need. So this negates qilla and naqs, which is insufficiency and wantage. It's an old English word, wantage, that they need something. So it negates the fact that there's, there's no qilla with Allah, there's no insufficiency, but also there's no naqs, 
There's nothing is nakas. He's not, he, he's not missing anything. And then, lam yalid wa lam yulad, this tanfi al illa wal ma'luliya. It negates cause and effect. So there's no, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not, uh, was not caused. And even though we use majazan, we say Allah is the cause of the universe, it's not in a cause and effect relationship. Like for instance, when Allah says, Normally the fa would be sababiya uh, because it's a is a fa'al amr. But the fa there is ta'qib. Fayakunu. It's not fayakuna. Because there's no cause and effect with Allah. In other words, you know, Aristotle called God the unmoved mover, the first cause. And what he said was, he 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 because he had to be consistent with his philosophy, he said that creation has always existed with God because you can't separate the cause from the effect. And this negates that, that Allah creates and, and it simply is. There's, there's no relationship to the cause and the effect, like somebody pushing something. There's no ittisal, right? in what we call cause and effect in the world. So that negates illa and ma'luliya. وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفْوَانَ أَحَدْ تَنْفِيَ الشَّبِيحْ وَالنَّظِيرِ So it negates any likeness and any peer. So these are the eight types of kufr that Surah Al-Ikhlas negates. And I, I've told this story many times, but it really had an impact on me when I was very young. I was in the United Arab Emirates when I was studying. And, there, and, the, and I was with some Bedouin in Al Ain, we were out. Uh, I, I, I used to go with this man, Abdurrahman al Sanjari. Sheikh Abdurrahman was from Mosul, from Al Iraq, a really beautiful man. And uh, you know, he, he was one of my early teachers there in the Emirates. And he used to, he used to go do da'wah to the Bedouin. I mean, not really da'wah because Muslims, you don't do da'wah to them, you do da'wah to non Muslims. You do Amr bin Ma'ruf and Nahi an Munkar to Muslims. So, so we, we went, and, and he, he, uh, he used to, mashallah, have a good impact on them. So I was with him, and I, I was probably, I think I was 19, 20, maybe 21. And, and one of the very young Bedouin, they all had sticks, because they have these camel sticks that they have. And he said to me, uh, you know, wh what were you before you were Muslim? Because I told him I was a convert. I said, I was a Christian. He said, he said what, what do they believe? I said, well, they, they think that, that Isa is Ibn Allah, that he's the son of Allah. And, and I, as God is my witness, he said to me, The older one next to him took his stick and hit him and said, Lam yalid wa lam yulad. And he literally hit him and just said, Lam yalid wa lam yulad. And I thought, subhanAllah, these were probably illiterate people. But because they had Surah Al-Ikhlas, <laughs> you know, they, they weren't susceptible to that shirk. It's amazing. So, fi hal al-arifin wa nisbati laddhatihim ila laddhat al-ghafilin. So the condition, and Gnostics, you have to be careful with this word. Unfortunately, we don't have a good word for arif. In, in, in English, but Gnostic can be confused with Gnosticism uh, in Christianity and esoteric philosophy and things like that. So I'm not using it in that way. I'm using Gnostic to mean uh, somebody who knows God. Um, so because it's from Gnosis, which is knowledge, and Kano, Kano is originally from this root. So the word know is, is from this root. So we have agnostic, but we don't have Gnostic, you know, it's somebody who doesn't know as opposed to somebody who doesn't know. So that's how I'm using it as a Gnostic as opposed to an agnostic, because an agnostic says, I don't know. The Gnostic actually knows Allah. So the relation of the pleasure, so he's saying if if you had this shok 
this yearning to meet and know God greater than your yearning to eat and procreate and do these other things that you do in the dunya, you would have preferred the paradise of knowledge over worldly desires. And this is why Abu Hanifa said, if the kings knew what the pleasure that we were in, al ilm, they would send their armies to try to take it from us. So ma'rifah is a great pleasure. There's a hadith, it's Dalami relates it, but the, the, the hadith states that an alim muttaki'un ala firasihi yufakkiru fi ilmihi is khayru min abid ya'budullah sab'ina sana or sab'ina am. That like a, a scholar reclining on his bed, reflecting on knowledge is better than 70 years of devotion because everything is in devotion. But the animals don't have ma'rifah, not like we do. And that's why knowledge is so central to our religion. It's, it's ma'rifah that makes us human. They're all, the, 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 the rooster, he can outperform uh, uh, any human being in, in, with his hens. You know, the pig can out-eat any human being with his appetite. Uh, the, the, the elephant can outlift any human being with his strength. The, the cheetah can outrun any human being with his speed. All the animals, can, they, can, they, they not only compete with us, they can outdo us. The beaver, uh, look at the beaver and, 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 and what it can build with just these materials. The bee, the bee, we can't make honey. Bee can make honey. All these things. So what is it that makes us uniquely human? It's, it's al-aqal or al-aqal. Or, you know, if you're a, Abu Hanifa said it's up here, the other three said it's here. So you can, it's either one. Now we know there's a relationship. So, uh, but it's the qalb, it's the aqal. Lahum qulub, la ya'qiluna biha. They have hearts, but they don't use them to think. So this is why it's so important. So I love this picture uh, from, because this is like, this is the person penetrating the mulk into, into I mean, obviously you can't, we, we can't get the malakut, but it's the idea that, this is, this is our pursuit, is to get past this, this mulk, all the sensory, and get into the meanings. You know? And so that's, these are the people of Ghafla. They're literally, they're living in a, in a fantasy world. I mean, one of the reasons why Plato did not want images in his Republic was because he said, this is already an image once removed from reality. So you don't want doubly removed from reality. So you're in the Truman Show. You're just, you're living in this complete artificial world. And this is what's happened now with all of this people in, on, online and in these, uh, they call them virtual worlds. Now you have virtual friends. You don't have real friends anymore. You have virtual friends, virtual reality. There's no such thing as virtual reality. It's actually unreality. That's why it's virtual. So this is something that we have to really think about because we're called to penetrate. To go to the, the, to the, to, to the ends of it, to penetrate it. We're called to You know, we're, we're called to penetrate the heavens and the earth, to really go into another world. Uh, Ibrahim was shown the malakut of the samawati wal ard. Ibrahim السلام, he wasn't content to he wanted to know mota. I want to know these things. Don't you believe? You know, I believe. I just want my heart to have about. So all of these, this is the pursuit that we're here to be engaged in. And we have little time. And you can get completely sidelined by all the politics and all the madness, and, and you can miss this opportunity. Because it's a short time. We're here for a short time. We're not here for a long time. The Al Arifun Yandarun il al Akifin fi Hadid al Shahawat Nadar al Ukala il al Subyan and the Ukufi him al al Ladat al Lab. The people of Allah, they look at those who are obsessed in their appetites, like the intelligent people look at children wasting their life in the pleasures of games. You know, one of the Arifin, he, he said that he wished he could go to all the, the uh, maqahi. You know, in, in Cairo, they have all these um, 
cafes. And he, he said he wished he could buy their time that they were wasting. Just because it's, it's wasted time. I'll tell you one of the worst things that ever happened to me when I was very young. I was with some of the Salihin in Algeria. And, and, and we were walking, there was a cafe. And these were like traditional, you know, wearing turban, jalaba. And there was a cafe. And, uh, and I just, I wanted some coffee. So I asked them if we could get some coffee. And they kind of looked at each other. I didn't think about it. So we sat down, we had coffee. And then when we left, one of them said to me, he said, that's the first time they'd ever been in a cafe. And they were old, older men because they saw it as a place for a ghafla. Like that's where the people of ghafla hang out. You know, so it was a real uh, eye opener for me. So, you know, there's a wonderful poem, Thomas Gray said, I just thought I'd uh, put this in here. I like poetry. He, he, was, he went and visited his school where he'd gone to school and he saw all these uh, youngsters playing in, in the quad. And, and he, he thought about the fact that they, little did they know what they were going to confront as adults coming into adulthood and having. So he wrote a beautiful poem and in it he said, to each his sufferings, all are men. We're all going to suffer. To each his sufferings, all are men. Condemned alike to groan. We're all going to have pain. In this world, Allah, this is something that Allah promises us. We are going to test you with, with hunger and fear and all. This is dunya. The tender for another's pain, the unfeeling for his own. So tender people will actually suffer for the pain when they see. Like you, you see, some people can see what's happening around the world, like in Al Quds or in Yemen or in Libya, and they just have their dinner and not think of any other people they really lose sleep over it because they suffer with them yet ah why should they know their fate you know young children since sorrow never comes too late it'll come soon enough and happiness too swiftly flies thought would destroy their paradise like the children are in paradise no more where ignorance is bliss tis folly to be wise so the child, ignorance is bliss. And that's, they should be ignorant. That's their place. But we should not. The fault is in us that we grow old in ignorance. And that's what, you know, Paul says, when we were children, we did the things of children, but now we are men. Let us do the things that men do. You know, giving up childish things. Like Playstations. I mean, now you have adults playing games. It's amazing. And spending large times, I mean, shetranj, which is a chess, you know, some of the people used to play on occasion, even uh, some of the scholars, even Abdul Bar mentions others, um, some of them considered it prohibited, others said, no, it's makru, others said it's permissible from time to time, but not al mudawam alayh. I read actually, I wrote an a essay on that, on chess uh, and, its, and its position. But now what would they think of all these games, virtual reality, people putting on things and entering into virtual worlds and just losing sight of reality? So Imam al-Ghazali says, You know, they, the, the mustawhish is the one he has wahsha, you know, he's, he feels alone. You know, the Arabs say, Ja'far uh, al-Sadiq, he said that, um, he said, Thalatha izuha dhul. There's three things that the iz is dhul. And he said, al uh, wahsha walaw layla. You know, being alone, even if it's for a night, you know, it's, it's difficult for people to be alone. And he said, uh, a su'al walaw kayf al-tariq. Having to ask a question, even if you have just asked directions, is you know you're you're put in a position. And and then he said a a a a dain a debt even if it's like a penny, you know those are so so wahsha is hard. But the people of Allah have they feel it in the world, and that's why they they have a a a, a kind of sorrow for the next world, and and that's why they prefer al uzla wal khalwa. وَهِيَ أَحَبُّ الْأَشَاءِ إِلَيْهِمْ 
there's a, there's a uh, so so you know the, my own teacher Marabat al Hajj he actually left the world like he went into the desert now people can say is that sunnah it is a sunnah of iqrar the prophet sallallahu said that people could flee the world and go into the shi'af al jibal or go into the deserts he gave that option for people and there are muslims that have done that it's called the path of uh, awais al qarni right now the prophet sallallahu said it's better to be in the world uh, and and but there are people that do that and they do us a great service he did not however he produced countless scholars i mean he there are so many judges and and wa'av and and uh, qadis and muftis all over the world that studied with him we have people now in america that studied with him and and so but he was mustawhish like if you were with him they called him hadar ghaib present but but not like because he really wasn't you could see that he just he was he everything was just and then he would go back to dhikr like if you came with your board he would say mashi lawahak and then you'd read and then when he'd finish he'd just go back to dhikr until somebody else came and that and his life you know and i had the good fortune of literally staying with him in his tent for the first months i was there he he he, he told he invited me and he said come stay with me every morning around 3 he would wake and recite the end of surah ali imran which is sunnah every every single morning he would do that in the fi khalq al samawat wal ard and and then he would uh, you know alhamdulillah alladhi ahnani ba'da ma mati wa ya nushur he would say all the duas and then he would um <laughs> okay i got it right today inshallah oh. there alhamdulillah so but he was a master of Arabic grammar. He was a master of, uh, of uh, theology. He was a master of fiqh, qawaid, usul. I mean, his nahu was amazing, he wrote. But it, constant dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that, that picture does not do him justice. Because if you sat with him, his presence was so strong that the people, and I'm not making this up, people who visited him know this. His presence was so strong because there was just so much hudur with him. Like he was just hadar ma'Allah. He was present. And, and, and those people are a great gift. They flee from, from fame and wealth. They don't want it. Uh, they're not interested in it. And because they're in the ladha of munajat, they're in the pleasure of that intimate discourse with their Lord. And so some people will laugh at them. A lot of people, if they see these people, it's like, what kind of life is that? But they laugh at those people because they know what they're in and they know what the others are in. This is all from Imam Al-Ghazali. Al-Arif majghulun bi tahiyyati safinat al-najat li ghayrihi wa li nafsi. He's preparing the lifeboat for himself and for others. Because the ship of dunya is sinking. We're all drowning. So you need the lifeboat, Safina to Najat. In fact, arguably now we have to think as an Ummah, like the Titanic of the Ummah went down. It got, you know, it struck colonialism and it's it's gone down. We lost all of this, all these things that we had. So now you have to think, what do you put on the lifeboat? Like what books do you take with you? What knowledges do you need to preserve? What because so much we've lost so much. I mean, there's so many knowledges we've lost. We, we, our community has no idea how many knowledges we lost. I mean, all that uh, knowledge of geometry that they had that we can't even penetrate now. We've, we have over 10,000 manuscripts in scientific uh, that have never been read uh, for you know, hundreds of years. That's what uh, uh, David King, Sir David King, who uh, is one of the most important um, scholars of the Islamic scientific tradition. He said that he, all these manuscripts, they're unread. So he said, we don't really know what the Muslims knew because they haven't been read. And they're in manuscript form. 
So who's going to read them? Maybe, maybe you'll find that we, we, we had calculus. Maybe they discovered calculus. Because it's very odd that Newton and, and Leibniz got it at the same time. Maybe they had a manuscript. Who knows? We don't know. I mean, I, I don't know that, and I'm not suggesting that. But I'm saying we don't know, hypothetically. So that's what they're doing. They're preparing for the, the, uh, the flood that's coming. So here we are. Now we're coming to the end. Jawahar al-Quran. So we saw the muqaddimat was sawabiq. We went through those. Now we come. That finishes the muqaddimat and the sawabiq. The aims are, there's 763 verses that he considers jawahir. He identified all of them. So Imam al-Ghazali is like a deep sea diver. He went in to the Quran and he pulled out all of the jawahir and the pearls. And he's, he's saying 763 verses in the Quran are about the kibrit al-Ahmar, these three yawaqit that, that, that he talked about to teach us about Allah. So that's in the Quran. And then the Durar are all the verses that teach you the path to God. So there's 741. It's interesting how close they are, right? So there's 741 he identified that are the Durar. They're the, the ways that we get to God. Uh, some of the most important ones, I'll go through these very quickly because we already did that. Things like uh, 2, 222. So this is a, a Jawhar because he's telling us about God. He made the earth a bed. What does it mean a bed? Because it's literally called firasha. Well, Fakhruddin al-Razi said, the whole point of a bed is it should not be too hard and it shouldn't be too soft. It has to be perfect, right in the middle. So he made the earth, it's not too hard and it's not too soft. So if it was too hard, you couldn't build on it or grow uh, food or plants or anything. But if it was too soft, like sand, you couldn't build on it either. So he made it earth where it's just right. The Goldilocks factor. There's actually a book about that. How the the, the earth is that we're, this is, you know, he called it the Goldilocks factor because Goldilocks tried the porridge and it was too hot and then the porridge that was too cold and then the, the, the porridge that was just right. The whole of, of, of the planet is just right for us to be inhabiting it. And that's what he's saying, that he made it just right for us as a firash. It's not too hard. It's not too soft. It's not too hot. It's not too cold. It's, it's perfect for you. It's amazing. He did this. And then, was sama a bina'an. He made it, he put it as a bina. It's a canopy. Now we know about Van Allen's belts that we've got this canopy over the earth that's protecting us, just like a roof protects a, a house from hail and from rain and all these things. We're being rained upon constantly by small uh, uh, rocks and then also by radiation. But the, the earth is being protected because, of, and what protects it? According to uh, you know, the theory, it's the turning of the earth. It creates this, the, 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 the Van Allen belts that generate this force field that protects the earth. It's a bina. And in the same way that you're constant turning back to Allah through Toba, and that's why you know, Rumi, represented that in that turning, but that turning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will generate this force field around you that will protect you from all the negative radiation, all these radioactive people that are out there, you know, these toxic people that are really sick because there's so many unhealthy people now because they've forgotten their Lord. They've got spiritual Alzheimer's disease. They don't remember who they are. They don't know who created them. They don't know why they're here, where they came from, or where they're going. And we know all these things. And what a gift. This is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then, Look at cherries, the taste of cherries. You know, uh, apricots, peaches. He could have made it all one thing. He could have had us eat mush every day. He could have had us just eat rocks. We'd have to break them down and, and eat. Uh, he, there's, there's animals that just eat the, you know, the bone, right? There's creatures he created that just eat bones, right? He, all those things he could have done. Flies, look at what flies eat. Look where they, look at the dung beetle, right? The dung, I mean, he could have done this to us, but he, رفعنا, right? he elevated us. 
And he gave us all these, and all he's asking one thing, shukar. Just, just show some gratitude. Everybody's whining. This whole planet is just a planet of whiners. It's just amazing. I mean, but earlier people, they were afraid to whine because they knew if you whine, Allah will give you more to whine about. Just gratitude. And then, فَلَا تَجْعَلُوا لِلَّهِ أَنْدَادَ And look at the mercy. وَأَنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ Jumla Haliya. So these poor idolaters that don't know, we're supposed to go teach them. But he's saying they don't know. They're ignorant. But you know. So once you know, don't set up idols. This is another Johar. Look at the let them respond to me. Meaning, I'll respond to you. Respond to me, I'll respond to you. And let them believe in me, and, and that will enable them to be guided. So, Allah witnesses, Allah is testifying to us that, that He's one, and His angels. And those who've been given knowledge, first and foremost, the prophets, and then those who are the waratha, qa'iman bil qist, upright, maintaining justice. La ilaha illahu al aziz al hakim. Inna dina inda Allah al Islam. The 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 transaction with God is is Islam. Enter into submission. Udkhul fi salmi kafa. Enter into this state of submission with Allah. Into this peace. وَمَا مِنْ دَابَّةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا طَائِرٍ يَطِيرُ بِجِنَاحِهِ إِلَّا أُمَمٌ Now we know the truth of this. They're all umam. All of these creatures in the earth, he's telling us. And he's saying, ثُمَّ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ يُحْشَرُونَ They're going back to me. And he tells us, I haven't left anything out in the book. Some say it's Loh al-Mahfuz. Others say it's the Qur'an. But the Qur'an has everything you need. There, everything is there in the book. This is one of the amazing. I, uh, there's a hole, but I need to get through this because my time's coming through. This is the first command in the Quran. This is the pearl. So the first pearl is the first command. Worship your Lord who created you and those before you in order to ward off harm uh, or to be mindful of him. Right? What is life of this world? It's just la'ib and lahu. Look at people. There's just work to play. They play and then they die. And lahu, entertainment. This afterlife is better than this life. And now we've had these people, very popular celebrities and things, saying, telling people the afterlife's a hype. You know, it's just pie in the sky. You know, this is Joe Hill, you know, the labor, you know, in the sweet by and by, you'll eat pie in the sky. That's a lie, right? That was a song that the communists sung because there's a song in the sweet by and by about going to the afterlife. So it's like they, the commies, they say, oh, it's just a hype. It's all just to keep you uh, uh, oppressed so you'll never rise up and break the chains. And this is just, well... Why is it that the prophet, when he was teaching these things, he was the most oppressed? He wasn't teaching them when he was in power. He was teaching them when he was oppressed. All the prophets were oppressed. So they're teaching this and they're oppressed. They're not oppressors. If the oppressors take it and try to use it, which they do, you say you said Dean, you know, they try to uh, politicize religion. That happens, but that's not what it is. So this is this afarat aqidun. You know, don't you use your brains? And then also those who who make imara of the masajid, they believe in Allah on the last day, establish prayer, pay the zakat. Don't they contemplate the Quran? These are all pearls. These are Allah's showing us how to get close to Him. Imara al masajid. So those are the maqasid. And finally the lawahiq. And we're done with this. So, so I mean, this is really just the beginning. My hope is that this is going to encourage you
to want to study this and actually implement it in your lives. So I've just, I've given you an overview um, and I've gone fast and I understand that. All, each one of these things, we can go into great detail and, and the Imam does in this extraordinary book, which is, is um, these two go together. So the, so the original Jawahir is actually the two books, the Kitab al-Arba'in and the Jawahir. But because he gave permission to print this separately, to be a separate book, uh, scholars have uh, used it separately. He said, if you want, you can separate it from this. Because this, um, this is really the theory. This is the practice. So he's giving you the theory and practice. And this is the best edition, the Darul Minhaj. This is my beloved brother, uh, Sheikh Omar Bashkhaif. He's really amazing man who's been serving. Uh, he lives in Jeddah. He's Yemeni Saudi. He's been serving the 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 uh, the books of our tradition for for years, printing really beautiful editions. He's got twenty Syrian scholars working doing the tahqiq. They get the earliest manuscripts, and and really this is the itqan of our ummah. So this last one, which is Kitab al-Arba'in, I'll go through it very quickly. He has it. He breaks it in like the Ihya into four. So he's got Ma'arif. The, the knowledges, and then a'mal al-zahira, the actions, the outward actions, and then the akhlaq al-madhmuma, blameworthy characteristic traits or morals, and then al-akhlaq al-mahmuda, the praiseworthy traits. So in the knowledge, he's basically, again, you get back to, each one has 10 foundations, so it's 40 altogether, um, because 40 is a sacred number. Um, so again, knowing tawheed, this is all tawheed really about the qudra of Allah, the ilm of Allah, the irada, the sam' and the basr, the kalam. So these are the, the seven attributes of, uh, of the, uh, the uh, mutakallimun. And then uh, the eskatan, the, the ma'ad, the last day. So that's the ma'arif of the book. So he goes, each one has a chapter and he explains each one. And then finally nubuwa. So there's your 10. And then the next are the a'mal al-zahira, and they also have 10 foundations. Prayer, zakat, fasting, pilgrimage, and then Quran recitation. So this is really important. And, and my advice to all of you, hadikum bi You really go back to the book of Allah. Awrad are good. You know, there's, there's a lot of awrad that people do. My advice to you is Quran. Do the adhkar of sabah wal masa because those are actually better at the time, according to the ulama, the ones the Prophet ﷺ did in the morning and the evening. There's a lot of iterations of them, they're good. But overall, Quran. Alikum bi kitabillah. Quran recitation. He puts this, and Imam al Ghazali, la yafturu an tirawat al Quran. He was constantly reciting the Quran. And nobody could penetrate the book who didn't read it constantly. He said once a month is for the zalim li nafsihi. Uh, every once a, a, a week is, is the muqtasid. And then the sabiqun bil khayrat is every three days. My advice, I mean, this is, I don't want to make people, uh, I can't do that. Just take half a page. Start with half a page. Just half a page a day. Make a commitment to read it, and not just read it, but actually, if you don't know Arabic, to read the translation, to think about it every day, just a half a page. And then once you get into a habit of doing that, then do a page, do two pages. You can do easily a juz in a half hour if you get relatively good at reciting Quran. It takes a half an hour. You could do a juz a day. It's not hard to do. That's a half hour to the book of Allah. And, and then you read it once a month. And, and so that's all you have to do. Just take something. The Prophet ﷺ said, خَيْرُ الْعَمَالِ أَدْوَمُهَا وَإِنْقَلْ The best actions are consistent, even if they're a little bit. And then the adhkar uh, and da'wad. So he puts those in there. Because there are, like, mindfulness is really important. People talk now about mindfulness. That nobody was more mindful than the Prophet ﷺ. So all the du'as, those are the best way. If you want to follow the sunnah, the best way to follow the sunnah is to, I mean, obviously to have good character uh, and, and akhlaq, but to practice the du'as that he did in the different 
uh, situations of the day to the best of your ability. So when you wake up, do the du'as of waking up. When you eat, do the du'a of eating. When you finish, do the du'a of finishing. When you dress, do the du'a of dressing. When you uh, leave your house, there's a du'a. You know, these are all the du'as that he did. The beautiful du'as. In fact, nobody has the du'as in their religion that we have. I'm, I'm telling you, I mean, I, my undergraduates in comparative religion, so I did study all the major world religions. I mean, I'm not an expert by any stretch, uh, but I've never seen anything like our prayers. I mean, I, I know a lot of Christian prayers, you know, I know, and there's beautiful Catholic prayers. And you know, some of the prayers of St. Thomas are beautiful. His prayer of, of learning is a beautiful prayer, you know. But I've never seen anything like our Prophet Sallallahu prayers. So that's really important. And then, Qarab uh, al-Halal, seeking halal livelihood. Husn al-Khuluq, good character, character traits. And then Amr bin Ma'ruf and Nahi an al-Munkar, that takes, the, the, he gives the rules, but you have to be careful with that because a lot of people don't know the rules. Also, of Tiba' Sunnah, and then following the Sunnah, because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi is our, he's our guide. And we should do our best to follow. And there are a lot of sunan mahjura that we should learn. And then the blameworthy trait. So he gives 10. Gluttony, right? This is a big problem. People eat too much. One of the things that, that now there's so much study in, in diet, one of the things that they found out is that as you lower your caloric intake, your body actually gets better at utilizing the amount of calories you're doing. And so you don't need a lot. And the Prophet ﷺ said it's enough to have luqaymat, just morsels. In fact, Qadi Abu Bakr identified exactly how many you need. He said 30 a day. And he said, in other words, 30 handfuls of food a day, like you know the Arabs eat with the three fingers, 30. That's all he said you needed, right? And he said you could eat them at one time, that's the way the Prophets eat, or you could eat it two times, that's the way the Salihin eat. Sahid ibn Tasturi was asked about people that eat three times a day. He said, build a trough for them, right? So, so we eat too much, and then we waste food. So the Salaf didn't waste food. So gluttony is a big problem. You know, one of the things, this whole thing now with COVID and everything, where's all the preventive medicine? Like healthy people. Where, you know, if you look at most of the people that are getting really sick, they have what they call comorbidities. Now, arguably, some people have those because you know it's genetics, and that's undeniable. Even weight, you should never judge people about weight because there are people that really have genetic uh, problems with weight. So be very careful about fat shaming in that way because people really do have those things. But for most of us, that's not the case. And Omar, he once, I won't say who it was, but he once saw one of the Sahaba who had a pot belly and he, he lifted his ihram and he looked at it. He had his durra. He lifted, he looked at it. He said, that would be better if it was on somebody else. In other words, the calories that you're taking that you don't need, you should be feeding people that need them because there's literally people starving. And then talkativeness, you know, loquaciousness. People, we talk too much. Humans talk too much. Ghadab, anger, is a big problem. I mean, we just saw this, uh, apparently somebody I, you know, killed this man at a Dunkin' Donuts because he, he, he said a racial slur to him, which is wrong. But, you know, he was an old man and he punched him and he fell back and broke his uh, skull and died. And now this, this young man's looking at, 30 years because it's uh, older people, the crime against them is, is 30 years. So that's an example where sticks and stones may break my mo bones, but names will never hurt me. That's when we were kids, we all learned that. If somebody said something, like they would, you know, they would call you names. Like kids are very cruel like that. I won't say what they used to call me, but. You know, I remember saying that, you know, you just go like sticks and stones may break my moans, but names will never hurt me. I mean, that like a little kid's taught that, that not to get triggered by names. Now, if they 
if they touch you, like Malcolm said, send them to the cemetery. You have every right if somebody puts their hand on you to defend yourself. But even there, there's a, the Sunnah of Uthman was to not even do that. He took the Sunnah of the two sons of Ibn Adam. And, and, and Imam al baghwi said that was the first Sharia, was nonviolence. Imam Baghwi in his tafsir about the, in the ayah about uh, where Adam Cain uh, killed Abel, he said that uh, Abel was not in their Sharia allowed to defend himself even though he was the stronger of the two brothers, which tells you that the original sharia was nonviolence. So the violence is a rukhsa. It's not an azima. I mean, think about that. It's very interesting. And then hasad, hasad is the worst. And people envy, hasad is just amazing. Like you can see envy, the, they call it the green-eyed monster. And if you want a real a liter literary study of envy, nothing better than Iago, the great envier. Because the poor Othel, you know, Othello, the Moor, he envied the Moor. It's interesting that he made him a Moor as the object of envy, because that play was about Spain and, and Morocco and England. Because he was... Uh, Mansour al-Dhahabi was at the time trying to make an alliance with the English against Spain. And, and Sant Iago de Matamoros. Iago is St. James, the, the Moor killer. So he named him Iago. And so Desdemona is, is uh, Queen Elizabeth, Othello's Morocco. And so Spain w did not want them to come together. That was my interpretation. I actually gave that um, talk at the Globe Theater. That was my interpretation. The Moroccan ambassador was there too. He liked it. <laughs> anyway, but envy, envy eats good deeds like w fire burns kindle. Like, and, and nobody, as, as a great philosopher once said, people will admit to a felonious crime before they'll admit to envy. Nobody, oh, I don't envy him, really. Really? And, and it's stupid because, for, I mean, like, I can understand why, you know, Miley Cyrus might envy Lady Gaga because they're just people of dunya and one of them has more followers than the other. So maybe that's true. Or whoever the latest are, um, Candy B or whatever, Cardi B, yeah. So whoever they are, like, they have the most followers. And so artists envy each other. Because, you know, and they'll watch each other and they'll watch, ah, he can dance better than me. And, ah, you know, you get really angry. But people of Allah, should they envy each other? If, if a scholar is more effective than you, you're winning. Because the whole point is to bring people back to Allah. So why would you envy that person? Why, why would you envy that person? It's just really sad. And, and then al-hasud la yasud. The Arabs say, you know, the one who envies will never be. So the fact that you're envying because that person it, it, it has leadership qualities that you don't have, the fact you're envying is the reason why you're not in a leadership position. Because if you didn't envy, maybe Allah would put you in that position. But the reality of it is you're stupid to even want it because it's a tribulation. Like who wants to be a leader? The Prophet ﷺ said to Abu Dhar you know, that you, he has had success who dies and was never put in authority over anyone. Like just not having any authority over anyone, that is a successful life. Because you're going to be responsible. All of you are shepherds and everybody's going to be responsible for your flock. So the bigger your flock, the more responsibility. Could you imagine being a ruler, a leader, like a, of a country? I mean, I've been running a, a small college and the, the headaches and the difficulties and the trials and tribulations that go with just that. And I think, what would it be like to run a country? It's just amazing. So, and then hubb al mad, love of wealth, that's old. Hubb al jah, people want status. And it's an illusion status. 
It's a total illusion. First of all, we're all going to die. And then what? One of the things that uh, Mark, in, in the meditations, one of my favorite quotes from Marcus Aurelius, he said that people that are concerned about what people think about them today, a uh, hundred years from now, like, you know, oh, he should worry about his legacy. You know, there's people who say, he should worry about his legacy. Legacy is on Yom Qiyama. It's not, it's not here. So, so Marcus Aurelius said, the people that worry about what people are going to think about them after they're dead are as stupid as the people that worry about what people think about them now. Because the same people are going to be around after they're dead. So, like, who are you trying to impress? Imp you know, impress your Lord. You know, like, yeah, please Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then kibr is a big one. Kibr. kibr is like, uh, it's like um, blood, high blood pressure. You don't know you, don't know you have it. The, the hidden killer. Yeah. And then vanity. Vanity is, is it's kibr without a person to be mutakabr ali. Like you're just impressed with yourself. You look in the mirror and you think you're wonderful. And then ostentation, the riyah, lip service, eye service, ear service, wanting people to see you doing this, that, or the other. And finally, the, the praiseworthy traits. The first one is tawbah. It all begins there. Khauf and raja. And then zuhud is not so much asceticism, but detachment, not being attached to the world. And then patience, sabar, uh, gratitude. Sabar and shukr are really important. And then ikhlas and sidq, sincerity and truthfulness, tawakkul, mahabba, contentment with the divine decree. Sidi Ahmad Zaruq says, Kullu amrad al qalb mudaruha ala adam ridha bi qada ila. All the diseases of the heart revolve around being discontent with what Allah has decreed. And then, and that's why he, he ends it with those two. And then, Al-Mawt wa Haqiqatuhu. We're all going to die. And, and, and the Quran, in, in many ways, and I wrote in the essay that I did on the death in the Quran, when I was asked to write that, I actually uh, excused myself. And, uh, and uh, Dr. Nasr, you know, who's an elder and, and uh, you know, one of the living philosophers, he said, I'm not, this isn't a request. Um, so I, I, and it took a long time. I spent a lot of time on it. It was actually much larger than the, the edited down version. But what struck me about doing that essay on death in the Quran was I really realized that the Quran in some ways is a death meditation. There's not a page of the Quran that doesn't have the fragrance of death on it. And not in a morbid way. It's, it's in a way that really brings you to life. This is one of the things that Dostoevsky, the great Russian uh, novelist, when he, when he was relieved from his firing squad, you know, he thought he was going to die. So he looked death right in the eye. And then when, 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 when he, he was uh, pardoned at the moment, they, were just, they, they said, ready, aim. And then the man said, no, 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 stop. They're, they've been pardoned. So you could imagine what was going through his mind. But he said, every moment from that day forward would be an infinite moment. Like he would, just the gift of life, the gift of life, of just to experience it. And that's the thing, we, we are going to die. And death is tuhfat al-mu'man. And we shouldn't fear death in that way. It's going to be a great release. But while we're here, the Prophet said, do not desire death. لا يتمنى أحدكم الموت. Don't let any one of you wish for death. If you have to, then say, you know, that ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you life as long as life is good for you and then that he will cause you to death when death is better for you. And he used to say after his prayer that when arata bin nasi or bi ibadika fitnats and faqbidni ilayka ghayr maftun. He would ask that if civil strife and calamities are going to descend, then take me before it happens. So that's a dua of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But when you have security, you should do everything to preserve security and peace. Everything. 
because once you lose it, I mean, we, we've got some Syrian brothers and sisters uh, in, in the audience. You know, people know once you lose the blessing of security, even when, when you have difficult governments and things like that, the rebellion, there, it's been proven again and again, if you want to read the book on it, Whisper of the Blade is a good book. Uh, revolutions just bring horrors and terrors. They don't make things better. They end up making things worse. This has happened again and again and again, and men do not learn. They don't learn. We have to change ourselves, and Allah tells us that he will change our conditions. That, that's, that's what we have to do as people. But it's a great blessing to live in a society that that's, has civility and has social order. It's a great blessing because it gives you the opportunity to get close to your Lord. Once you lose that, you're, you're just in hala. You're, you're, you're in anxiety. People, you know, I mean, the things you hear about what's happening in some of the Muslim countries. And these are countries that I visited and knew when they were, I mean, they had their problems but nothing compared to what they have now. And this, this is what people really need to think about. And the same is happening in this country. One wonders where this country is headed because you can see the breakdowns are happening. You know, the shoplifting. Uh, my brother was telling me in, in the city that people like homeless come in and just shoplift from, uh, from, from Whole Foods and they don't, they, nothing, they can do nothing about it. And, in some ways it's charity, but you have to see the breakdown, what that means for a society. Because property, once you lose the sacred right of property, I mean, property is one of the mahfudat al-khams, you know, hafz al-mal. And, and once you lose that, the ability to protect your property, it, everything breaks down. So the merchants go out of business. They closed down Walgreens in San Francisco because people were just going in stealing all the time and they couldn't, they weren't making any profit. So now all the people that need that service, it's gone. So things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood dim tide is loosed and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The worst, uh, the, the best lack of all conviction, while the worst are filled with passionate uh, intensity. You know, this is, this is, this is uh, you know, this is a reality that happens. And when it breaks down, people will wish. They'll realize what blessings they had. Once it all breaks down, then they just regret. So you have to just, you know, just recognize the blessing. Alhamdulillah. So I did it. Allahu uh, Akbar. That, that's, uh, that was a map of Jawahar al-Quran and Kitab al-Arba'een by Hujjat al-Islam, the great Imam al-Ghazali. May Allah reward him, bless him. He actually asked, he said one of the reasons why he was doing it, so that people make dua for him. Subhanallah. And here we are a thousand years later, literally a thousand years later. You know. I was born 900 years after him. Is that, he, he was born literally nine, 900 years to the year. Go ahead. Is there questions? Yeah. Right. How can we develop our intuition? Bismillah. How can we develop our intuition to be like that of Imam al-Ghazali? Are there exercises to develop this or is it given by Allah? Imam al-Ghazali is a very rare, um, I mean, in human history, there are a handful of people that, that are in his league. And, um, but he has given us a path. And I think as you practice that path, I think your intuition will get greater. And I know that Madad is real, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives imdad uh, to people. And sometimes uh, you can feel it in your own life. So I would, I would try to do my best to, uh, to set out on this journey if you haven't set out and to stay on it if you're on it. Can the Islamic tradition like the one of early Muslims be revived without political institutions? 
meaning solely by restoring the intellectual resilience? That is a, a really good question. So kudos to the person that asked that question. Um, the Prophet ﷺ clearly stated in the hadith of Sahih that is in Al-Bukhari that Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman asked him, what do we do when there's no political institutions? And he said, then cling to the root of, of the tree. And that tree is Islam. And the root is Tawheed. You have to cling to that until death comes on you. And so this religion does not need political institutions. It's a great blessing to have political institutions. It's a great blessing to have mahakam sharia, to have qubat, to have muftis, to have all these things. It's a great blessing. But this religion began a strange thing and it will return a strange thing. And that's in Sahih Muslim. Where did it begin? In Mecca, without political institutions. But it had a guide. So you always need warathatul anbiya, the guides. But I... I I really think people need to seriously reconsider this, this uh, position. Uh, we, 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 they had an Iranian revolution. Now the, the atheism in Iran, the rise of anti-Muslim sentiment, the same thing happened in other places where so-called Islamists got into power because you can't solve the problems. They're, 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 they're immense. And people, you have these slogans like Islam is the solution. The first thing that, uh, and I won't say who, but one of these people, the, uh, these Islamists, when they got into power, the first thing they did was start negotiating with the IMF for loans. Because suddenly reality hits. We have a whole system that has been created. What really we have to question, I think, is working within these systems, the Muslims in these Western countries, to, to really recognize that we have alternatives even though the muslim world's a mess they're a mess not because of islam they're a mess in spite of islam it's because they're not practicing islam do you think killing those poor uh, shia little girls in afghanistan has anything to do with islam like that person who blew that up i mean i have to believe they couldn't have been muslim it must have been some kind of just to make Islam look bad, because I just can't believe somebody could be that crazy and think that they were getting close to Allah by killing little girls in a school. You know, and those poor families. And, and how are they going to feel about their religion? People lose their faith. And you could be the cause. Don't make us the reason why people persist in their kufr. And forgive us. In the tafsir, they say he asked not to be a fitna for the disbelievers because that would be worse with Allah than any sin they did that affected themselves. By turning people away from God's religion, that's a worse sin than any sin that you practice in your privacy. So that's a, that's a big uh, problem. What is Imam Ghazali's view on free will and qadr? Free will and qadr, we have free will. You just have to assume that. But we also have we're determined, you know. And this people can say that's an that's a excluded middle. It's not, it's 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 muratab wujud. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us free will. Imam Ali was once asked about uh, free will and qadr. Is is an insan mukhayyar or musayyar? You know, does he have choice or is he determined? And he told the man to lift his leg. And he lifted it up and he said, now without putting it down, lift the other one. He said, I can't. He said, it's between those two. And so we, we've experienced free will. I mean, I, I'm here. I came here by my own volition. Now, I, it was also decreed that I would be here and you would be here. Whoever is watching, listening, this is all part of the qadr of Allah. But you chose and you're going to be rewarded for whatever good you choose and whatever evil you choose. And so don't overthink this thing Allah is Allah can square a circle you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is 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 uh, is is qadirun uh, ala kulli shay from an incoming Indonesian freshman to Zaytuna Imam al-Ghazali has significantly influenced previous scholars like the Wali Songo in Java but right now ignorance of his teachings is spread in the region how do we recontextualize Ghazali's teaching? Well, first of all, we need people to know what it was. Um, 
the, the beauty of Imam al-Ghazali is that he'll, he taught, I'm reading a man who wrote literally 1,000 years ago. It's a miracle that I can understand his language because I cannot understand English from a thousand years ago. I, I really. So that's a miracle just to be able to, to read him and to understand and know what those words mean. And, and he's a very clear writer. He's a very beautiful writer. He's not a turgid or obscure writer. He's really quite a stunning pro stylist. So that is a miracle in and of itself. But he speaks to us. He, he speaks to us in our time. He's not outdated. A great work is never outdated. It's always fresh. And, and, he, and he's fresh. If rational knowledge is validated by intuitive knowledge, then how do we validate intuitive knowledge? That's the point. You, you can't validate intuitive knowledge. It's you can't prove it's something you know because there, there's levels of intuition. So at the most basic level, we intuit things like um, the, 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 the the sum of the parts, right? Is equal to the whole. We that's something that you just you can't prove that. It's something you know intuitively. And so these are the bidihiyat. And so uh, so that's that's very important. But if you're asking about like ilham, how do you know that inspiration or a kind of intuition, like you have a gut feeling, or uh, there's a book called The Gift, which is about people having gut feelings before they got into uh, dangerous situations. So that type of intuition is real. And, and uh, more, some people are more sensitive to another. Some people just avoid it. So, but you, you have to be careful. I mean, you have to use your reason. So they work together. What's called the nous and the episteme in, in the Greek. In, in Arabic, it was called the aql al-gharizi and the aql al-muktasab, you know. That the, these are the two. Uh, so they work together. And, and if they work together, probably they lead to al aql al hakim, you know, wisdom, the hikmah. How can we revive chivalry before it completely diminishes? Well, I think, you know, good for you, just that you want to do that. So you might end up looking like Don Quixote, but that's okay. Uh, Don Quixote is a, is a noble. You know, his spirit is noble. So people might laugh at you. Now I'm afraid to open the door for uh, some people because, and then you don't know anymore who's who either. So it's, it's a strange time, but we should, muru'a is very important. Muru'a, it's a beautiful word in Arabic. You know, just being virtuous and being chivalrous, uh, gallant, you know, somebody, you know, gallant people, courageous people. These are all virtues. We sh the best way to do that is to, to really be a virtue cultivator, to learn the virtues and then cultivate the virtues. He gives you all the virtues. He has a beautiful book called Mizan al-Amal, which I'm hoping we're going to publish with the Zaytuna curriculum series. We're done. We're done. We're literally uh, editing the Mizan al-Ma'yar al-Ilm. But inshallah, we're going to do the Mizan al-Amal, which is his of how to to really learn uh, virtuous behavior. And then what is your advice? Uh, will a non-Arab who recites Quran while not knowing the meaning get the same reward as the one who knows its meaning? It, it's a good question. I wouldn't worry about that. I just worry about your own reward and you will get a reward. And the more difficult it is, the, the, uh, the, 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 the more reward you have. But the mahara, the people that are masters, are with the angels. So just do your best. Um, people that know Arabic have an advantage. If they acquired it from the time they're children, um, Allahu Anam, maybe that's just the fall that Allah gave them. But if they earned it, uh, then Allah is going to give them the reward of, of putting all that time and effort into learning it for his sake. So... It's good to, to commit to learning Arabic. I hope people do that. Um, it's, it's a beautiful language. You won't regret it. Even if you took 15 minutes a day, you know, you could just do it every day. There's nice books too, and there's all this online resources. 
I mean, never in the human history has it been easier to, to, to learn knowledge. And I'm talking informational knowledge. Real knowledge is probably a difficult time because in the past they had much easier, far less distractions. They had a lot of salihin and arifin that could help people. But in terms of just learning knowledge like information and, and sciences, this age is, is just amazing. I mean, I think about before Google of just what I would have to look up and the amount of time that took and what I can do now and, and, and the, the, the uh, accuracy of a lot of the information. It's amazing. Even though we understand the negative, uh, what is your advice to all dedicated young students who want to master this tradition? Uh, my, the best advice that I could give you is uh, nahu. Like really take grammar very seriously, learn grammar. You cannot read these books without grammar. You will never be able to penetrate this tradition without good grammar. Grammar is very important. And then uh, finding good teachers is really important. And then um, really having ikhlas in your niyyah should, you really have to examine your niyyah. If, if you want to become a teacher, I think you've already got a problem. And, and you know, I, people come to me and say, oh, I want to be a teacher like you. And I'm like, and I think about my own journey. I never thought that I would be a teacher. I wasn't interested in being a teacher. I was on my own personal journey. I wanted to know God. I had a, a head-on collision, and I, and I saw death before my eyes, and I thought I could have just transitioned into a whole other world and I don't know anything about that world. And I felt like I was spiritually an embryo. That's what I felt like. And so I set out and Allah guided me to Islam. And then when I became Muslim, I wanted to learn Arabic. I wanted to learn the Quran. I didn't want to hear what other people had to say about it. I wanted to know for myself. So I went, I went and, and Allah, Alhamdulillah, makharaja. You know, I just, things were facilitated. I, I, people gave me uh, opportunities and I ended up, and then I went to, when I found out about Marabt al-Hajj, I met his son and I thought, if this is a son, I want to meet the father. And, and I went and I, I trekked across the Sahara on a camel. I got sick. I got hepatitis. I got dysentery. I got, I mean, it wasn't an easy journey. I was arrested in Algeria. I spent two weeks in, in, a, in, a, in a real hell hole. I mean, a horrible prison. Um, so my journey wasn't like an easy journey. People, you know, you see people later and you think, oh, you know, it all came easy. Uh, I don't think so. You know, a lot of nights spent, you know, studying. And uh, I, you know, when I first became, uh, started studying Arabic, I literally got Warabet's dictionary and just tried to memorize the whole thing, you know, and, and, and learn it. So, you know, that's, uh, it's hard work. People want, the, you know, uh, Euclid was asked if there was an easy way to learn uh, geometry. He said, there's no royal road to geometry. <laughs> it's just hard work. If you put in the work, Allah is going to give you something back. You know, the more work you put in, it's like the, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the golfer, you know, Ben Hogan hit this amazing like putt, and somebody said, I can't believe how lucky that was. He said, that's true, but it's amazing how the more I practice, the luckier I get, you know? So people think they see a finished product and they don't see what went in, the hours and hours and hours that went into it. So I just hard work, you know, if you want to. And also to Matt, I mean, I'm a beginner in this tradition now, and that's not false humility, it's a reality. Uh, I don't have the intellectual gifts that are needed to master the tradition. I wish I did, but I don't. Um, and I've seen real masters like uh, Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya, you know, Marabt uh, al-Hajj wal Fahfu, Sheikh Marabt Ahmed Fad, Abdullah Iwad Ahmedna. Sheikh Abdullah Iwad Ahmedna memorized Al Bukhari in my house, <laughs> you know. I tried to memorize Al-Bukhari. I couldn't do it. So, 
you know, Allah gives to whom he pleases and, and you have to just know your place and do your best and whatever he gives you. But the most important thing is ikhlas. Uh, knowledge is a beautiful thing, but ikhlas is a more beautiful thing. You know, because if you are sincere, Allah will give you the knowledge you need to know. And many, many people with very little knowledge have gotten very close to Allah. And many people with great knowledge uh, we're very far from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So don't despair. Our, our religion is a religion of the pursuit of knowledge, um, but there's a baseline. And then you can, uh, if you're not academically um, inclined, you can become a devotee and, and do uh, Quran and do the adhkar and, and, and do night prayers and do those things. That's a path. There are many paths to Allah. Knowledge is one path. And, but everybody needs baseline knowledge. Once you've fulfilled that, it's called fardain. Everything beyond that is kifaya. You just need a certain amount of people to do it. So it just, not everybody is, uh, is inclined to this, but those who are, are. Uh, even though we understand the negative effects of social media, would you suggest it is the best medium to reach Muslim youth? I don't, I, I yeah, I'm gonna, Allahu alam, I don't know. Um, it, there's an element to it that's like a black box. You know, it just, um, I don't know who's behind it, where it came from, who started it, what their intentions are, but I know that al-amadu bin niyat, actions are by intentions. And a lot of this came out of uh, military application. And uh, I don't know what's behind it, but I know Iblis is making very good use of it. Uh, and it's it's quite terrifying the dark web and what's going on on the dark web, um, you know, organ trafficking, uh, child pornography, uh, you know, human trafficking. All these things are happening. So I don't know. I truly believe that the internet is mentioned in the hadith. There's no way that something this momentous could have come about without the prophet mentioning it. He mentioned everything that would come, he warned his ummah. And I think we all just need to, uh, on the other hand, Allah says, <laughs> fight with the weapons that you're being fought with. So there's an argument. So people have to know themselves and what they can do. But uh, my advice to young people is read books, get off screens. Uh, I think they're, they're harmful generally. We, we know this now that they, they, they are harmful. Uh, even women have higher rates of, uh, of abortion, spontaneous abortion uh, uh, that work with computers. This, these are facts. So we don't know what they're doing to us. We're all energy and resonance and we don't know what 5G is doing to us. We don't, we don't know. I mean, humans, we, we don't know very much. We're very arrogant. And one of the signs of the latter day people is they think they know everything. <laughs> The, the people of the earth will think that they have power over everything. We don't, we, we don't, we know very little, but I know that the best time in human history was in the seventh century Arabia. And the best um, city that ever existed was the city of Medina. I do know that. And, and their lifestyle was the best lifestyle and they did not have internet. They, they had another type of internet, right? They, they had, they didn't have AOL or, Google, or they had straight to God. Yeah. So, Alhamdulillah. Please support Zaytuna. All the people that um, requested du'as, just know that uh, Sister Manal, may Allah reward her for all the work she's doing, uh, has given us. She sends all the names out. So, people here are making du'a for all of you. We thank you for your support. Please. Alhamdulillah, you've been very generous this year. For those of you who have already donated, we're, we're really overwhelmed by the support. But for those of you who haven't, I really hope that you'll support the college. What we're trying to build is something for you, for the community, and for the people that come after us. So may Allah reward all of you, bless you, increase you, elevate you, give you uh, openings from the Book of Allah, make the Book of Allah, inshallah, the spring of your hearts, and may the flowers of its meanings uh,
bloom brightly in your breasts. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, uh, give you all the rewards of this month. And may he, inshallah, give you a blessed Eid. And may he, inshallah, uh, give you 30 days. Inshallah, we're going to go look for the moon, but I think that it's um, going to be 30 days. So it's a great blessing to have another day, inshallah, in, in paradise. Uh, Alhamdulillah. Ramadan Mubarak. Chand Mubarak. May Allah bless all of you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And salams to uh, Imam Majid and his family. Uh, I think he said he was going to be watching. So may Allah bless you and the Adam Center. We're uh, kindred spirits out here with you. We love all of you. We love Adam Center. May Allah reward you, elevate you, increase you. Uh, may Allah bless uh, Dr. Aisha and, and, and uh, Dr. Rehan for all they do and all the people. Uh, that are working, Imam Zaid, inshallah. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless Dr. Hatim for his work with uh, uh, the, uh, uh, trying to um, shed light on a lot of the trouble that's happening now. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, bless uh, all the teachers, uh, wherever they are, people that are keeping this deen alive. And jazakumullah khairan, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.